morning, dear colleagues, young colleagues mostly. Um, I'm a neurobiologist or brain scientist for more than 40 years. And for 20 years, I did ordinary neurobiological work at the laboratory. Then um, I got a brand new institute and a lot of money. And I started a interdisciplinary research program um, called the Determinants of Human Behavior, which I started together with lots of psychologists, psychotherapists, psychiatrists, even sociologists. And we ask, how does human personality develop? And uh, what are the possibilities and limitations of these developmental stages and how we could change people. This is a basic question in psychotherapy. And for the last 20 years, I did um, psychotherapy research, but also became involved in coaching and questioned what can we learn from neuroscience? Why changing people to do what we are would like them to do are on the one hand difficult, on the other hand possible. And uh, there are a lot of dreams and illusions about this, and I'm pleased to tell you a little bit about what neuroscientists have found out, together with psychologists, of course, and psychotherapists. Uh, there's one point of departure, and I could call them uh, acceleration of changes. So there's digitalization, globalization, competitive pressures, speed up change, and so on. As you know, the software industry, projects are launched faster and faster. Could the organization, that's a question themselves, and the employees of the companies manage this faster development? Perhaps not. So they would need help. Is this fast development driven by competition? And do the customers really want this fast change, the customers? And there are some doubts. And there's a second point of departure, and uh, I could call them the uh, limitations of changes of personality and possibilities. In the context of work 4.0, new working conditions are being proposed, like permanent change, agile, flexible working, mobile working space, increased teamwork, more individual responsibility, more swarm intelligence, our com uh, cooperative intent, how you could call it. And products are changing rapidly as well. Consumers uh, have to adapt, sorry, have to adapt to new software much more quickly. So SAP comes, and I have this experience in Switzerland, and within a few days, SAP had to be introduced in a big Swiss company, and they completely failed, absolutely failed, and this cost millions of uh, Swiss francs. <laughs> And they had to repeat everything much more slowly. The problem is that all these dreams and concepts are not scientifically well founded. Not at all. There are almost no problem, no studies showing uh, how what uh, we are asked or being asked could really work in, in long term. This dream is popular, has been popular in politics. So a leading polit German politician told me 20 years ago, oh, uh, our society is based on permanent change. And we have to have three, at least even in Germany, three different jobs. And when we're 30, we have the next job. And when we are 45, we have the next job. Now ask him, and you, he is now the foreign minister for foreign affairs, or still. Uh, I ask him, uh, Gabriel, do you really believe that humans are capable of this permanent change? So that's the question. Um, the problem of change management, and I have dealt with this problem in, uh, for example, the context of energy turnover, where we saw, and people saw and asked me, how could be possible that everybody is positive of this energy turnover two years ago or three years ago in Germany. Everybody enthusiastic. But only 10% of people 
feel that they are obliged to do something. Most of the percent say, oh, it's absolutely necessary, changes are absolutely drastic and necessary, but not with me. And of those who are convinced that it's me who has to do something, it's only 10% who really do something. So one out of 100, and this is our real data. And so they are shocked and uh, ask, how is this possible? So, uh, formulating it, most people generally accept the necessity of changes under circumstances, uh, circumstances, whatever changes, in ecology or in business or in, in, in programs, combined with convincing arguments. So, uh, the problem seems to be, I have to present convincing arguments, logical, rational arguments, and we have learned since uh, school and since antique times that people will follow our advices when they're based on rational arguments. How could one not accept our rational arguments? Much fewer people, however, let's say 10%, draw conclusions from this insight for their own behavior. They also think, oh, the others should do something. I'm paying so much taxes. The others should do this. Or not me, or not in my case, not in my backyard. This absolutely trivial. Go in Germany to uh, Schleswig-Holstein, where they have this big uh, energy railways. And the debate is in East Schleswig-Holstein, West Schleswig-Holstein. The East Holstein is said it should be done in West. and way around, and if you go to Thuringia or Bavaria, they say, oh no, the, the railways have to go to, to other parts. Not me, not in my backyard. And this is understandable, because it is afflicting her own interests, except that you can make a lot of money of selling your land. <laughs> then you are uh, fast accepting it. But the most astonishing the thing is, still fewer people really change their behavior in a long-term fashion. This is even stranger because once you're convinced it's me who has to change something, what could be better than this deep conviction? Yet only one tip out of ten really changes. So there must be obstacles which seem to be completely rational. And the question is, where does it come from? And from the perspective of psychology and neuroscience, this has to do with a complex relationship between insight, motivation, and action. And this is one of the most complex relationships you can imagine. And up to recently, it was not understood. Because we thought, and lots of industry and psychology think, once you have put forward clear arguments, and once they accept them consciously, they will do this. But this is not the case. And everybody knows from daily life. So, one of the fundamental insights is that information, whatever, about changes, you have to change things, you have to do something differently from before, does not automatically lead to insight. And insight does not automatically lead to behavioral changes. And one primary obstacle is, or fact is, that rational cognitive formation processing, I will explain this in a second, proceeds at brain levels not directly involved, there's a D missing, uh, oh, they, they do not directly involve emotions, goals, and motives. So, insight and rational arguments have no direct access to control of behavior even anatomically and physiologically. There's one level that is detached from the part of the brain, I will illustrate this, that actually controls motivation, feelings, and actions. And this is good, so this is good, had certain reason behind. And second, the emotion, goals, and motives lead to long-lasting behavioral changes only if there is a compatibility between conscious and unconscious motives and traits of our personality. This is the second deep difficulty. The first is that reason has no direct uh, contact to behavior. And the second is that conscious motives are mostly different from unconscious motives. And the question is, could we 
have to uh, acquire knowledge about unconscious motives. I'm not a Freudian. <laughs> so, we studied this for 20 years, and we could show, we as a lot of psychologists, psychotherapists, psychiatrists, and neuroscientists, that this happens or at three different limbic levels in interaction with the cognitive lingual inside our brain. So here is the human brain from the left side, and here the spectacular cortex, and we are very proud of the cortex. It's by far not the largest among animals, but we have, I can tell you, and my wife and I, and my wife's also a professor of neuroscience, we made good estimates how many neurons uh, are inside this cortex. There are 15 billion neurons with um, 300 trillion contacts. Sometimes that's just quite a lot. It's very complex. But this cortex from the outside is not the seed of personality, of emotions, of goals, and action control. It's not. It is the seed of consciousness, of reasoning, of imagination, of sensory perception, of motor control, but not of personality. The question is, where does personality sit inside? It's, of course, deep inside the brain. This blue region uh, should include this part here, too. This so-called limbic system. It is the seed of conscious emotions, goals, and conscious uh, parts of personality, uh, they are few in number, in the area, most is unconsciously unconscious. So few parts of the seed of, uh, of personality, of the limbic system, are consciously perceived. These two parts mostly, and most of the other parts are strictly unconscious. They have never been conscious, they are not accessible by even by the best psychotherapist, uh, in contrast to what Sigmund Freud said. It's impossible. So we see, we learn what per really drives our personality, the deep motives we are not aware of. They reside in our brain. They develop. And I will explain to you in a second. But we are not conscious of them. This is the deepest problem that we are foreigners to ourselves. And we have the illusion that we have the exclusive access to our personality. The philosopher Descartes said, this is the most direct access to everything, myself, reflection. But this is deep illusion. Others usually know us better, not only your psychotherapist, psychiatrist, better than I know myself. For simple reasons, I have no access to my unconscious. So, I just briefly define three levels, deep in the brain and more superficial, and then the fourth cognitive level. There's the deepest level, I call the deepest limbic level, which is just in the very, very deep uh, side of the brain. Deep limbic level, this is, are the centers that control our bodily functions and our basic uh, uh, autonomous, autonomous functions, also sleep, wake, feeding, sexuality, fight, flight, dominance, sexuality, rage, and sexual behavior. But also, it is the seat of individual temperament. And uh, these are abilities and attitudes that are rapidly developing in the first weeks and, and months, and we observe them in our children, for example, and we are surprised that when we have more than one child, child they may be very different. Not necessarily, but different. And I can tell you from my own experience, not my children, but my grandchildren, they are identical twins, and even in identical twins, the temperament is different, or may be different. It is in my, my case, and this was great mystery, how it could come, and now we know that they are genetically identical, but not what we call epigenetically. These are the true control elements, and they are partly influenced 
these genetic control elements that make us really individuals and different, even among identical twins. These are mostly determined per prenatal influence from the brain of the mother. This is very recent insight, and, uh, but it's one of the greatest uh, insights we had in the last 20 years. So the brain of the mother before birth controls the development of the brain of the unborn child in a dramatic manner. And this explains many, many things why we are individuals already at birth and that very little, it, although it's being acquired by the intrauterine environment, it becomes fixed as if it were genetically controlled, but it is not. So we come to the earth, we are born with individual temperament, as you know, and if you have more than one child, you know you can do almost nothing. So it's openness, closeness, trustful and timid or open and energetic or restricted, all the fundamental parts of personality, and all psychologists who dealt with this kind of temperament, either say inborn or not, or they determined, they agree this cannot be changed in a dramatic manner, only very superficially, and I accepted this in my children to have three children, but this is the way, they're nice people, but you cannot change it. <laughs> very nice. Okay, this is the uh, hypothalamus, where this resides, and this is the point where our brain starts developing. Uh, then we have a medium limbic level. This is the level that develops immediately after birth and is uh, characterized by what we call attachment experience. So the relationship between the baby and the mother or the uh, another person who cares for the baby need not be the mother, so the caretaker could be the father of the person, provided he or she can offer all the things a baby needs, not only for body experience, for body development, but for psychic development. And in this <coughs> development, the mother, future mother or caretaker, strongly imprints her own personality in a positive or negative sense to the soul of the child. Deeply imprinting. So this is a deep socialization, first taste socialization. And so we can say, even in the first three or four years, we are imprinted by the others. Our individuality is mostly determined by behavior of the others. This is first years. And uh, most probably if this happens consciously, as opposed to what I told before, before birth, this is consciously, but it cannot be remembered. There's a so-called infantile amnesia. Babies have, and, and ch little children have consciousness, but not a long-term memory. So it falls out and cannot be remembered. So we have two parts that are unconscious. The most important part of personality, one is deeply unconscious, the other was conscious but cannot be remembered, and this forms to two-thirds or 60% uh, our personality. That's a problem. Uh, now there is a, this happens, for example, in the amygdala. Here is the hypothalamus. The amygdala is the major center for innate emotional, emotion and emotional conditioning. For example, we here we learn to understand the expression, the gestural expression, facial expression, and uh, timbre of the voice, all these non-verbal communicative signals, he will learn them, and they have to be trained by our mother or other caretaker. And if this doesn't function, then we develop personality where we will be unable to understand the emotions, the objects of other people. Especially, for example, uh, people, cr criminal people, we 
who are being studied will be unable to distinguish aggression from fear. This develops very early in life, and this is fatal for many criminals who are uh, feeling offended by people who, in reality, are fearful. This is very well known in criminality. And this happens if you are not, have, don't have a good attachment relationship with your mother, for example, when your mother when herself is mentally disturbed, then she transfers her mental disturbances to the child. This is uh, transgenerational transfer of trauma, for example, a big, big thing. But let's assume everything goes well. Then we also we learn in the interaction what is pleasant, the reward system. We're doing something, for example, we are smiling at our mother and she gives us something to eat or to drink and she touches us. This is primarily rewarding. And when, once she does it, in our brain, so-called endogenous opioids and cannabinoids are released. This is brain-derived opioids. And then we feel well, and when our mother is touching us and carrying us, then serotonin and other stuff is released, and the baby is happy. So this is reward, and everything we are going for in our life is based, maybe sex or alcohol, or maybe a good position, or becoming elected as chancellor, or to get a chair at the um, university or uh, top position at industry. Everything pleases you only because in a long chain it leads, leads to the release of endogenous opioids. This is the <laughs> money that finally pays for reward in the brain. And once you have a deficit there, then things do not please you again. Then nothing attracts you anymore. And this is well studied in deep depression people. There's another equally important system. This is the reward expectation system. So you learn what made you happy. The complete realm of things in your world, what makes you happy may be so different from the others that it's infinitely different. But again, your memory, your reward memory tells you, oh, this was nice. Uh, when I was together with this girl or uh, boy, or when I be, got my chair at university or became elected as a chancellor of Germany, I was so pleased and I felt so great. So let's do it again. <laughs> so there are people who want to be chancellor again. <laughs> Why? Because they have the memory. And only because they have the memory, it was so great when I was elected Chancellor of Germany last time. Or when I elected Pope. Let's do it again. <laughs> yeah, why not? So this is the illusion or reality. Reward expectation is do it again, Sam. Because it was so nice. That's called motivation. Motivation is identical to reward expectation. Also, the avoidance of bad things is equally rewarding. That's clear, even more sometimes. This is reward. So, and this is also trained very early in life and only motivated. So what I want to tell you is very early in our life, our personality and the goals, the motives, we are following in our a very early imprinted and can be modified only to certain degrees. Then we have the upper living level. This is secondary socialization. So we go to school or kindergarten, to school, to university or whatever, and then we learn to adopt our primary personality as I described it to social reality. So we come to school and we see Oh, with my egoistic mind, I cannot survive if I do not adapt to the others. I have to make compromise 
I have to collaborate, I have to help others, because otherwise they would not help me. So it is a uh, reciprocal altruism. So I do something for you, if you can expect, really expect, that you do something for me. This is the basis for friendship and cooperation. It becomes difficult if this reward expectation is not clear. I do something for you, but I have no idea whether you will ever do something for me. This is a big problem, as you know. But also at this upper limbic level, it, uh, uh, it develops profit orientation, recognition of fame, friendship, love, acceptance, moral ethics, also empathy. Here there are famous studies that this is our pain system. I will not go into details. When I feel personal pain, some parts of my cortex, the insular cortex, are activated, but also if I observe other people being treated painfully, that the same centers are activated, and this is empathy. And the very important thing is, only when I got enough empathy very early in life, I developed this ability. In hardcore criminals, we observe, frequently observe that they have no empathy and they, we can test this because the insular cortex is silent once we show them video clips where we as normal people are really empathetic. Uh, this is here in this part above the eyes, the cortex, the eyes are here. This is the highest control center, the orbital frontal cortex. Now we have one level, uh, and, and one level, one important part of is impulse inhibition. So they tell you, you should, whatever you do, you should think of the others. You should be fair, you should be led by justice, you should always think about what's good for the others, not for me, and all this altruistic, but repressive, and <coughs> reciprocal altruism, all these rules have to develop unless we do not understand the goals and motives and ways of thinking of the others. So we, here we see the difficulty to be cooperative, cooperative. Presupposes that we have a personality that has developed these things, and this relates back to our early printing. And so the presuppositions, the preconditions for being social, for cooperate, for working in a team are extremely special and we rely on abilities that evolve for 20 years. And if they don't evolve, like in autistic children, then we are in bad shape. Now we have the cognitive rather rational level. This is mostly the left, the left hemisphere, speech centers and the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. This is the way we are thinking. And as I told you, the problem is that this is a level of conscious, verbal, rational communication and decision making and the justification of one's own action in front of oneself and the earth. We are telling stories about us in front of ourselves and in front of the others. But these stories need not have anything to do with our personality, willingly or unwillingly. Mostly we tell the story we want to hear from ourselves or the others want to hear from us. When you ask, are you, will you be capable of filling this position, this work? Of course, yes. I, for the last 10 years I'm brilliant. Maybe just a naked lie. So, this has nothing to do, not necessarily something to do, or maybe in a very indirect way. The way we are talking about ourselves and talk to others may not have really something to do with our true personality. But we learn how to present ourselves in the most favorable manner, irrespective of our conscious and unconscious self. And this is a basic limitation to working together when we are based on pure verbal communication. This is the basic problem. When we 
talk to each other by phone or by, by uh, television or by laptop. We have based our interaction on uh, verbal communication. And even if we do it relatively intelligent, most instruments um, are so that we have no direct and constant voluntary contact to the eyes. Mostly, when I chat with my grandchildren in Oslo, they look at, at the television camera and not at me. But you can do this, but this has not been studied well. You have to have a look into the eyes, as we will see in a moment. So, the cognitive verbal rational level, which is loved by software industry, is a wonderful level, but has nothing to do with the personality. That's a problem. This here, this is the center of analysis, planning, and decision, language, but strongly bound to this, but not to evaluation. So now we have the problem that those parts in our personality that have the strongest influence on behavior is the least changeable. This is temperament. It's impossible to change. At, at long term. The unconscious medial lingual, uh, limbic level likewise has a strong influence on behavior due to emotional conditioning. It is being learned, imprinted, but it is difficult to modify. Not impossible, difficult by strong motivation and strong emotions and by long term exercise. This is what psychotherapy is doing if it's working. This is why we need psychotherapy. Or, or direct, strong coaching. The conscious upper limbic level has a weaker influence because it's learned and we learn that in one context we may have this way, in another context, at home, for example, we have in a completely different way, and we learn roles. And the, we were talking about just before, the biggest danger in industry is that we, at this upper limbic level, superficially adapt to changes. We behave as if we had accepted the need of changes, but we're just talking in a way of behaving superficially. Yes, us, we're doing everything you want us to do, but deeply, nothing changes. This is intelligent. If you are intelligent, you know how to behave so that your leader is thinking you really change your behavior as he wanted you to change. But it's not, because so many changes, faster and faster, you could not survive with deep changes. You start and it takes you two years, but next week there's another change. How could you survive? You have to change only superficially. And the cognitive verbal rational level has no influence on our behavior, but only in combination with the other levels. So, Clear and good arguments are not bad. They are necessary in our job. But by themselves, they have no effect, as we know. So everybody who wants to induce real changes has to strongly attach emotions. Conscious emotions, motives, or and unconscious. That's very difficult. And every politician knows this. Dramatic speeches. Why dramatic? Not clear statistics, uh, like our Chancellor Merkel, she, she loves calm speeches and rational arguments, alternative-less. So what, what does it mean, alternative-less? It's a rational argument, but it does not move people. That's a problem. So, methods for changing behaviors of colleagues and employers, that's a question. What can I do? Command and threat. From next month on, the following modifications will come into effect. We expect that everybody will obey these orders. Otherwise, <laughs> you're thrown out. The only advantage is have an immediate effect. If it works, no preparation is necessary. The disadvantage is <laughs> in January, yeah, you can write an SMS and you're fired. Just no preparation. It is strong advantages, it generates intimidation based on the position of power. 
You have to have power, otherwise it doesn't work. And also, uh, thread restricts the possibility for people, not evolves the possibilities. And changes of behavior will last only as long as threads are real. So there must be real power if the employees find out that the boss is just <laughs> shouting and crying and thumping. And afterwards, it ca he comes and nothing happens. And they learn it very quickly. Let's wait Monday and then Tuesday afterwards. We are on the good side. And threats from a powerful position always elicit the desire of revenge. There are very famous cases, recent cases, have followed from Lehman Brothers. He was fired, I think, at Goldman. And he was so centered on hatred, he wanted to show competitors because he was humiliated, as far as he sensed it. This is revenge. It's very bad. So the appeal to reason and insight, already talked, your you, uh, appeal to insight and to reason, alter, alternativeless measures, and everybody who rationally examines the situation with, without prejudice will come to the same conclusions. This uh, goes in here and out there. <laughs> because it is not attached to emotions, to motives. Addressing individual needs and attitudes. This is what we have to do. People change their behavior only if they consciously, intuitively, or consciously associate the change with a benefit or reward. Rewards may be material, the wages, bona, other material privileges. There may be social, this power, prestige, rewards, or intrinsic, pride of achievement, self-efficacy, and so on. This is nice. However, these three different kinds of rewards have their own peculiar dynamics. And we have to know this. Material rewards work immediately, money, but lose their effect quickly. This is in a negative exponential way when you repeat it. By any next occurrence, they're only half worth of the motivational value, and it's gone, and after three times, four times, increase in salary is just, the effect is gone. As everybody knows, social rewards have longer lasting effects, but likewise go into, uh, likewise lose their effect when repeated. So when you uh, uh, invent prices and, and other things, you can do this, but after one year, everybody has to have the same price and then it's senseless. The only, Reward that does not lose the effect, the, uh, the effect is intrinsic reward. The pride of achievement, self efficacy, the, the joy of doing something that is good for me, that develops my personality. However, this is not trivial. To achieve this is the best goal, but it's difficult to wait to go there. So, whenever People say, oh, the question of change management is very simple. Just you have, just have to bring people to intrinsic um, motivation. This is true, but how to go there may be extremely difficult. Because you have to find out what are the goals. Many people have only material goals or social goals. And only few people are intrinsically rewarded by their own job. And you have to search for, for the position. And they say, this is finally the position I always want to look for. So this is one baby criterion for personality, a personal, uh, to select the right person. Mental habits and perseveration. There's maybe the most fundamental difficulty in change management. As a boss, as a leader, you put many, many efforts in, in uh, having good relationship with your employees or colleagues, and you offer them material rewards, social rewards, you try to increase their intrinsic uh, attitudes. And I tell people, 
you are in Bremen, but it would be highly advantageous for you to move to Heidelberg. Wonderful, you get more money, you have higher prestige, you get everything. And I said, yes, it's a good idea. But let, let's wait for one week and talk to my uh, wife and children and so on, but it looks fine. Mostly after one week, it says, or one month, or half a year, sometimes. No, I'm, I'm not moving. I said, oh, how stupid. It's so much advantage, so much rewarding to move to Heidelberg. It's a very nice city. There are lots of interesting people here. Yeah. Why? The obstacle is a deeply rooted tendency to proceed as usual. The maintenance and execution of mental and behavioral habits is rewarded in our brain by the release of certain pleasure substances, the cause already mentioned endogenous opioid. Most people feel good when exerting habits because they believe to be on the safe side, it dampens the fear of change and of future. And accordingly, if you want to change people, you have to pass beyond the reward they get from their own brain by going on as usual. This is the danger, the best and the danger of mental and uh, behavioral habits. This is the problem. It's rooted deeply inside our brain, the so-called basic ganglia. This is, is the seed of our habits, mental, emotional, and, and behavioral habits. And they are encapsulated, and they are not accessible by arguments. This is just automatized, it's automatic. And then when we are doing something we're used to, to do, when we are even re rewarded by our brain, please go on and do as usual. And you have to go beyond this tendency of going on as usual. Importance of leadership. What are the characteristics of good leadership? This is now uh, rather difficult, rather complicated. Respectful interaction with employees. Self-confidence and self-efficacy to you, to trustworthiness, authenticity, competence in decision-making organization, communicative skills, theory of mind and empathy, flexibility in thinking, plan, acting, self-monitoring, endurance. And many of those things have to do with the ability to have personal relationships, deep personal relationships to your uh, colleagues and employees. And how do we grasp trustworthiness, which is the absolute basis of good teamwork? Absolute necessity. How do we sense this? There are two ways, one extremely quick way, sometimes less than one second. We have studied this now at Institute. And the other procedure takes two or three years. Very short uh, test of, for trustworthiness and long term. And the very short goes within seconds, something shorter. This is a famous experiment where people have been shown video clips of three seconds. And then immediately after thinking or, or, or reflecting what they have seen, immediately press the button, trustworthy, not trustworthy. And you know them, perhaps, but they don't talk you, tell you what came out, but just showing inside the brain, which was studied at the same time, the huge centers of the right side, just grasping trustworthiness or the absence of trustworthiness, within a second, because this is of high survival value. You immediately have to see by facial expression, by the voice, by gestures, uh, and this was absolutely necessary in the Stone Age. You immediately had to have a friend or enemy. And so this is not fully effective, as is sometimes claimed, but 70% effective because the person who finds sympathetic and trustworthy in the first second will be for you to 70% next year. But not 100, 
And you can make the bad experience that he was a nice person and trustworthy, but not a good, competent worker. This happens, but it doesn't. Trustworthy. And why is it so effective? Because the big centers by which we recognize trustworthiness intuitively and unconsciously are the same center that guide our own nonverbal behavior. In verbal behavior can lie as strongly as you wish, but not in nonverbal behavior, except you are a wonderful demagogue. Otherwise, you express your personality as it is, because the same centers control my nonverbal expression, mimic, gesture, and so on. They reveal relatively reliable our deep attitudes, convictions, and emotions, even the unconscious one. So they reveal something you are often not aware of personally. But the others tell you there's something in your appearance that it's not convincing. Did you observe yourself how unconvincing you are? This is a problem that I don't know my own performance. And this is 200, 300 milliseconds. And if you train yourself or are trained by concentrating of this fraction of a second, do it is possible, half a second, you just look at the face of other people without paying attention to, the, to what he says. So if you just uh, shut down uh, the, the loudspeaker at television, you observe politicians when you just see the faces. Then you could see their non-behavioral answer. They're often very different from what they're saying. This is very impressive. Uh, what can we do? What can the leader do in order to increase in employees the motivation for change? You have to control or even increase your own trustworthiness. You have to have control from the outside, and you have to be to appear competent. Not too much, but not just say, I'm so trustworthy. I'm so competent. Please, let's be friends. So the thumb is down if in the first seconds people do not realize intuitively that you're really trustworthy. And the mechanism I just explained to you, you cannot lie in this way. Also, better understand the way of thinking and feeling of employees and colleagues and take the results into consideration. This is, you have to evolve sensibility. A clear and honest demonstration of joint advantages of changes. This is very important. It has to be clear, ever change has to be uh, combined with the reward expectation of those people who uh, need to change themselves. It must be clear, or at least intuitively evident, what do we have to, to do? An acceptance of autonomy and creative collaborators. And so this means the goal of work 4.0 must be made compatible with the, with the basic psychological needs of persons regarding attachment, trustworthy, and direct personal contacts. Self-efficacy, meaningful work, and efficient changing world. Only sensation seekers go along well with the concept of permanent change, but at the same time, they lack consistency and endurance. Most people need a good ratio between constancy and change, and change always must be connected with efficient social attachment and intrinsic reward. That's stop here. I've written a book, a relatively successful book, in the 12th edition, only, unfortunately only in German, but there will be a translation. In English, and this is my last slide. Thank you for attending. <laughs>